Okay, so last time we went... Ah, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> last time we were going through these different uh, replication uh, cycles that depending on what type of virus you are, whether you are DNA versus RNA, let me make this big screen, there we go, whether you are DNA versus RNA, right? and remember I said I'm not going to really um, ask you too many specifics about this, except for the fact that, you know, know the difference between um, minus strand RNA and why this creates a problem, right, uh, because this cannot be read by the ribosome. So this has to be turned into plus strand, which is the same thing as messenger RNA. Um, and then we have some that are plus strand RNAs, but they could be read by the ribosome all right away, but instead they're reverse transcribed into DNA. And what did we see? What was the interesting thing that happened with this DNA? Where did it go in the cell? Anyone remember? It's double stranded DNA. Yeah, it can integrate into the host genome, right? And so it goes into the nucleus. And we use that your book gives you specific examples, right? For some of us, that helps. Um, for me, I never seem to can remember that. So as you can imagine, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna expect y'all to memorize that. I think that's a little bit too much. But the reason why I covered this before I covered and what was for homework, remember, and he actually did a pretty good job on this. Um, I had posted an announcement. I think I probably closed it out. I played it before class started for those of us that were here early because uh, I randomly picked this one, but I got lucky. He did a good job, I think. This is a good video on um, lytic versus lysogenic cycle, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, which modules wise, I forget sometimes that I have a whole list of animations and videos here too. Look at that. Um, so for those of y'all, right, that animation and seeing stuff moving is helpful. There's a whole list of them here, right, on that page for genetics especially and viruses. So going back to lytic. So there's some terminology, of course, involved versus lytic versus lysogenic um, that they use. So some, some bacterial viruses, right, we call them um, phage for short, bacterial phage, um, have only one choice. They can only go through the lytic cycle, which means just as we've looked at so far, they go inside the cell, they take over the cell, they replicate, they lice out of the cell. Those are referred to as virulent phages. Some viruses can do more. They can actually integrate into the host cell's genome, right? Like we saw with that DNA uh, choice for some viruses. and definitely for that RNA to DNA intermediate. So when that phage integrates into the host cell's chromosome, it's referred to as a prophage. And what happens is, and we'll look at a picture of this, is it integrates into it and every time that cell divides, it also copies the virus's DNA. At that point, it's referred to as a temperate phage because it's kind of hiding out, right? But it doesn't stay that way. 
there can be some stressors, different things. It depends on the, on the organism and the virus that will cause that prophage to pop off the chromosome and go into the lytic cycle. And that is called induction. That's an important, important, important term, induction, where it goes from hidden in that lysogenic phase to now it's going to switch to lytic phase. Tempered phages are said to be the ones that can do lysogeny or lysogenic. Immune to super infection. And this means that only one virus gets into the cell at a time. Because think about this. If they're going to incorporate into the host chromosome, if a whole bunch of viruses got in, there's not enough space, right? They're going to create such disruption to the chromosome of that cell, that cell will no longer function. Right? So only one of them is allowed in. Which is also true for influenza virus that we're going to look at today. They're, they're immune to super infection. One virus, one cell. They're very greedy. They're like, this is my cell. You can't have it. I claim it. And there's a way they do that. We're going to look into the specifics of that today. So this, this is a little bit different diagram than the one in your book. I like this one a little bit better. So right here in the middle, right, this virus has a choice. If the chromos if its DNA does not incorporate into the host cell's chromosome, it goes lytic cycle, which means it destroys the host cell's chromosome, it makes more viruses, it busts out of the cell, and then it goes and infects another cell, right? And it can keep going through this cycle. Or it has the choice of integrating into the host chromosome. And in that case, it's referred to as a prophage. When those cells divide, they copy the host chromosome and that viral chromosome. So at some point, whether UV light or something else triggers it, induction will happen where that chromosome phage, the phage incorporated into the chromosome, becomes unincorporated. In that case, now it's going to start going through the lytic cycle, right? So we can cycle between these two different phases depending on what's going on. So you all read an article, right? And I wanted you to comment on it for homework. It talked about this, didn't it? About how the viruses were setting out chemical signals. And if there weren't enough bacteria, it caused them to go which way? Lytic or lysogenic? Lysogenic, because then they could hide inside the bacteria. The bacteria continue to multiply. Because if you keep just lysing bacteria, are there any bacteria left for you to infect? No, it's kind of a survival mechanism, right? So that the virus can keep being present by being hidden inside the cell and the bacteria keep dividing. But if you keep lysing, eventually you're going to get to a point where you run out of bacterial cells to infect, depending on the environment you're in. So for those so those viruses, those tempered phages, they've adapted a way in which they can figure out, right, should we go lytic or should we go lysogenic, depending on the environment they're in. I would love to sit here and debate with you guys about <laughs> whether you think that would make them a living thing or not. Uh, but uh, we don't have time for that. Okay, so that this is the different groups. 
right? So the last thing that we hadn't talked about yet is how do they exit from the cells? Well, with the lytic cycle, right, they just bust out of the cell. So if it's a bacterial cell, they're going to have a way to weaken the cell wall and they're going to bust out of the cells. Remember I mentioned before, right, assembly, they believe is mostly self-assembly, which energetically would be very cheap. I don't believe it. <laughs> I believe there's probably more involved there. We just don't have the level of the ability to see what's happening, um, how those proteins are being added. And there's a really interesting research article, too, on the packaging of the DNA into the protein coat, the capsids, uh, in your book. But if you're an enveloped phage, you're not a naked phage, you're not a nucleocapsid, right? You're not a virus that's just nucleic acid and protein. You're one that needs an envelope. You actually get that envelope from modifying the host cell that you've infected, it's membrane. And so what they do is they insert their own viral proteins into the host cell membrane. That basically turns that membrane now into the virus's envelope. So the virus has to basically coat itself in this modified host cell's membrane. So as you can see, this makes sense for animal viruses, right? Because plant viruses and bacterial viruses all have a cell wall that make this impossible to happen, right? None of their viruses are enveloped. Only animal viruses can be enveloped because they're the only ones without a cell wall. And so this process is referred to as budding, right? So they'll, they'll bud off the surface. And this is HIV. Um, and, and this is because of these proteins, and I looked it up in your book before class. <laughs> but remember I said in the, in the beginning, too, when we first started, especially studying animal viruses, we thought they were just enveloped viruses because this was the most common that we saw. But there are uh, naked viruses that do infect uh, animals, which includes humans, right? We're animals tend to put ourselves on this little pedestal, but in truth, we are animals. We have animal cells. Does this make sense to y'all? So this is one major difference for envelope viruses, right? Where they've got to, at the exit phase, they've got to pick up that envelope from the host cell's membrane that they've modified with their viral proteins. So na most naked viruses, I said, are just going to, you know, crack open that host cell and they've got to damage the cell wall uh, for bacteria. For plants, remember, something else helps them. The most common thing is, is viruses. I mean, is insects, right? Um, but the virus itself can move within the plant from cell to cell connections. So it doesn't have to worry about the cell wall in that case. So influenza, right, our, our most loved virus, right? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it has two important spikes in its envelope. Um, it has hemagglutin and norimidase, and you can kind of tell by their names some of the things that they have the ability to do. Neuraminodase, because it ends in ASE, is an enzyme. Hemagglutin, heme refers to blood, gluten refers to the clumping of, right? So this a protein will actually cause your blood to clump up. So the, the virus will package itself up with its nucleocapsid, right? And there's this additional layer because it has multiple RNAs with the protein that gets packaged up, 
but then it's going to travel to the membrane where it has inserted into that plasma membrane of that cell neuraminidase and hemagglutin those two protein spikes and then as you can see it goes through the egress process where it's surrounded and then the virus can leave that cell and go infect other cells so which one do you think fills in the blank here is an, is the which one is the influenza envelope virus that appears to be involved in the attachment to the host cell receptor anyone want to gander a guess nope it's the hemagglutin right and so I always remember gluten right attachment right it causes our red blood cells to to clump up so that's the one that actually attaches to the receptors on our host cells the neuraminodase what it does when it when it gets into the cell is it shuts down the receptors that the hemagglutin binds to so like I said Influenza is a nasty virus because only one virus per cell. Once that virus gets in, it shuts down the ability of more viruses of being able to get into that cell. But this is a lytic virus, right? It's not going to incorporate into our chromosome. But he's greedy. One virus, one cell. So think about this. If you inhale a thousand of these viruses they're going to infect a thousand of your cells right because one virus one cell and then they when they bust out they bust out probably at least a hundred if not more so each one of your cells that gets infected is going to give rise to potentially a hundred more viruses as you can imagine, this is why you feel like shit, right? Because your cells are dying and being attacked at a very high rate until your immune system can get this under control, right? Or if you're lucky enough, the flu vaccine for the strain that you've been exposed to works that year. Why do we need a new vaccine each year? Because that hemagglutin changes. It mutates at a very ha rapid rate. And so the scientists are guessing, right, as it travels around the world, literally, what's going to come and hit us next? And so they try to make the vaccine such that you make antibodies that will attach to this hemagglutin and stop it from attaching to your cells. And remember, that's the first thing that needs to happen for viral infection right attachment but it attaches to critical things on our cells that you know we're not going to want to obviously give anybody a drug to shut down those receptors um, instead we got to go about it in a different way any questions on that so get your flu vaccine right Well, just like we saw for some of the viruses that we looked at, and we just saw for some bacterial viruses, they can or incorporate into the host um, cell's genome. And this can create problems. Um, some viruses, too, you got to think about it, it's getting into the cell. So it's interfering with that cell's ability to do whatever that cell was doing before. So it can cause what we refer to as cytopathic effects on our cells. So this is where we're talking specifically about eukaryotic cells, when a virus infects that cell. So this is a picture of some fish bash blastular cells. And here, what I don't like about it is they've kind of zoomed in, right? So you can see the nucleus of the cells, right? And all these cells look uniform and beautiful, don't they? They've zoomed out, unfortunately, in this picture right so this is at a, a lower magnification um, so you're not seeing right the nucleus you're not seeing it in this detail but what you are able to see is do you see how the cells have significantly changed and they've clumped up in this area 
This is where a virus is, is infected these cells. Now, what I find really interesting is a different cytopathic effect. That one's um, syncope. Oh, crap. I didn't even open the right PowerPoint. Damn it. That's fall 18. How'd I end up with the wrong one? I opened it from there. Do you guys have it? That's going to bum me out. I worked so hard on that PowerPoint slide. Ah, B, look. You guys do have it. I'm going to merge the two files. Let's see if I can open it. It's hidden behind everything else. There it is. Save files in 8,000 places. You lose track of things. There. No. Still not there. Oh, crud. Thank goodness for the internet, right? So, I'm going to find a good picture. I had put a, pro a PowerPoint slide together, too, and I'll, and I'll find it somewhere and show it to you all. So, this, this happens with uh, rabies. So, it infects the brain, right? So, these particular cells, what I forget what they're called, starts with a P. Kinji cells. I think it is but do you see this mass right here like so here's the nucleus of the cell and you see this mass these refer they refer to these as I think it's nigra nigri nigri bodies so this is a specific cytopathic effect oh yeah Kupikinji five Perkinji cells right and so here's another picture right where they actually pointed out <laughs> Right, so you see, this is the viruses forming inside the cells, right? Uh, and so this is this is characteristic of of rabies, right? So they tell you, um, and so they'll they'll autopsy, and I'll tell you, anyone know the we talked about this previously, the major carrier in Louisiana of rabies. Raccoons, right? So they'll take them, they'll autopsy them, right? They'll look at and make slides of their brain matter and they'll see this, right? So they can even identify this at, at the microscopic level that it has rabies. So that one's, that one's really interesting to me. I found that one really interesting. I'm really annoyed that I can't find that slide <laughs> that I looked at this morning. Oh, uh, somewhere. I will find it. Okay. So the other thing that can happen, and most of us have probably seen this or unfortunately experienced this at one time or another in our lives, is warts, right? So what warts are caused by is a virus infecting your cells. And it causes your cells to be abnormal. So that wart is actually your abnormal cells. Um, and so depending on where that wart is or, or how it was caused. Um, but like I said, it's a viral infection. So the human papilloma viruses are the ones that cause that. Um, so of course it can happen on your skin, right? The worst place is the bottom of your, well, I would say necessarily the worst. One of the worst places is the bottom of your foot is because you're stepping on it, right? And it and so it pushes in instead of being out and and so that makes it a little bit harder to treat and remove. Uh, probably the worst place would be in the genital region, right? Um, especially for women, um, because, you know, it, it can happen to the cervix. 
and you don't see that, that's an internal structure. Um, and it can deform the cells not only to the level of warts, but worse, it can cause what? Cancer, right? So uh, the human papillomaviruses, many of them have been linked to directly to cervical cancer, where it disrupts the cells so much that they become cancerous instead of an ugly wart, right? I don't know about you, but I think I'd pick a wart over cancer any day, right? Um, but viruses, because they get into cells, they can disrupt cells and they can cause these awful effects, right, of um, warts or, or even um, dis uh, causing cancer, what we refer to as a disease. Viruses are named differently than how we really name um, other things that can infect us and make us sick, right, like bacteria. Uh, a lot of the viruses that, especially ones that infect bacteria, um, have a letter and no number designation. And notice again, it says phage, so we know this is a virus that infects bacteria. The tobacco mosaic virus, it's named after the fact that it what? Infects, infects tobacco plants, right? So in this case, it was named after the organism in which it infects. Uh, Ebola is actually named after where it was discovered, the Ebola uh, River, right? So um, others, there had been named after the appearance of the virus, right? This, uh, the corona, the corona, uh, viruses, they kind of look like they have a crown to them. Others have been named after the diseases that they cause, right? So the hepatitis viruses are named after the fact that they cause hepatitis. So this is an inflammation of the liver, right? Hepa refers to liver. Titus just always refers to it, an inflammation. And unfortunately, there are several hepatitis viruses, right? And one of them, come to find out, um, we started lettering them, right? We have hepatitis A, B, C, and there's actually D, E, I think there's G, I don't know, we're going, to, let me tell you all, we're going down the alphabet, right? We're going down the alphabet. But one of them is, is relatively interesting. And at one time, it was referred to as a viceroy. And I'm not going to go into too many details, um, quizzing or testing-wise, on viceroids versus what they call them in your book now, which is satellite RNAs and satellite viruses. Um, because even myself, I still get kind of confused on these guys. <laughs> right? Uh, as I read through the book, I'm still like, Huh? What? Why? The definitions aren't very clear. Um, because, again, we're really, these are new, right? We're really trying to tease out what's going on here and what is happening. And then viroids, you've probably never heard of, right? Because they infect plants, right? And unless you deal with plants, right, you usually don't hear about these types of things because they don't infect us. Um, pyrons or piron or I always have trouble saying this one. It's pronounced two different ways. Um, I, prions, or pyrons, uh, I like to refer to them just as infectious proteins. What you do need to know about these is what they're made out of, what uh, nucleic acid uh, protein, and what type of hosts do they infect. Uh, and especially for prions, well, well, you need to be able to identify um, at least one of the diseases uh, that we commonly talk about that's caused by these infectious proteins. And that helps out too when you refer to a prions as infectious proteins, then you know what they're made out of, right? Protein. And they're actually, their name means um, infectious protein. It's a, actually an acronym. All right, so when we look at vi viroids, as I said, they're pretty exclusive to plants. We haven't seen them anywhere else. And they're just RNA. And RNA typically is single-stranded, right? And this truly is a single strand of RNA. And we know it's RNA because notice the U's, right? 
but it will fold back on itself probably to um, keep it oh really you're going to do this to me right now what time is it I'm going to let him leave a message. i got to get through this. Okay. Um, hmm. Probably to keep them structurally stable, right? They fold back on themselves. They form these stems and these loops where there's not complementary binding. They're relatively small, right? Less than 400 nucleotides. Um, but they they'll fold back on themselves. And this probably helps um, them resist what are called uh, ribonucleases. So ACEs means enzyme, right? So what do you think these enzymes do? They destroy RNA. But they don't destroy these probably because they do this binding back on itself, right? Folding back on itself. And so, as I said, so far they've only been observed in plants, and what they believe is happening here is that this RNA can stretch out. And when it does, it's binding to RNAs within the cell. The most important RNAs being messenger RNAs that are read by the ribosome, right? And the ribosome is only going to read that single-stranded messenger RNA. Well, when this viroid binds with the messenger RNA, now it becomes double-stranded, right? Ribosome can't attach, can't read it. So certain proteins aren't made by that cell anymore because it's infected by this viroid. So sometimes it's referred to as messenger RNA si silencing. And so this, this potato, although probably fine to eat, right? Do you see how its structure has been deformed in this area? This is where the viroid has affected it and has canceled out certain proteins that would normally allow those cells to form in a normal way instead of this deformed way. So good news, this isn't anything that affects us, right? But it will deform plants, right? Uh, spe specifically this potato one. All right, this is where it gets confusing. So we have two things here, and we have satellite viruses versus satellite RNAs. So based on the name, right, a virus we know has to have what parts? Nucleic acid, right, whether it be DNA or RNA, and a protein coat. At the very least, that's a virus, right? These are RNAs with protein, and that protein they encode for with their own genome. So notice they carry their own capsid protein gene. They can make their own proteins, but they need a helper virus to replicate. And so what we called hepatitis D virus at one time probably you it's it's tough. It's like where where do we draw the line for these definitions now, right? Because come to find out, on the inside of this virus, right, is not what you would see for hepatitis B. It is not its nucleic acid, it is not its viral protein. It is instead what we call the delta antigen, right? This is what is typically referred to as hepatitis D, which is an envelope virus, but when you look at the envelope, y'all, the proteins embedded in that envelope are hepatitis B virus proteins. The only way you can get this is if both of them are in the cell at the same time. And so basically what probably happens is instead of the hepatitis B viruses genomic 
content and protein instead of that going inside of the envelope instead the delta antigen its RNA its proteins gets packaged in what's the good news for us is remember attachment is how viruses get in right so when you look at this it's hepatitis B virus proteins that are on the surface, right? That are going to be used for attachment. So the hepatitis B vaccine works against both hepatitis B and D. Because D is this, right? It has D on the inside, but it's coated with B. So if you have the vaccine against it, it's going to bind to these proteins on the outside of this virus and stop it from infecting your cells. That's the good news for us. The interesting thing is, is that, okay, right? We, at first look, they're like, oh, this is a whole new virus, right? Oh, no, it's not, <laughs> right? This is part of B. But this part is different. So at one time, this was called the Viceroy, right? This, what we're looking at right here, right now. They call it a satellite virus now. So basically, you can imagine it's like a hijacked virus. Satellite RNAs are less complex, right? They, the only thing different about that virus that you'd be looking at, like the picture you'd be looking at, is the RNA inside. The virus itself, right, the helper virus that they call it, is required for replication, of course, and it codes for the protein that would surround the RNA. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Hence why I'm not going to ask you any questions on any tests or quizzes about these guys, but I am introducing them to you, right? So you know that about their existence, right? And especially as it relates to hepatitis B versus D, that's important for us health-wise, right? The good news is that, you know, that's why hepatitis, why we don't need a separate vaccine for hepatitis D right and why we can be protected against both of those infectious agents with one vaccine right other than that right let's move on to 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 prions or in or proteinaceous infectious particles right so that's where they get their name so no nucleic acid so no genes they're just proteins Hence why they're called infectious proteins. They are very infectious agents, and they are responsible for several um, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, right? Commonly abbreviated TSE. I like the full name because this tells us something, right? Obviously, this is something that begins to be transmitted, right? If you ingest, say, this protein. What does it do? Well, the mad cow's disease, which is the common name for one of these, gives you an idea. The, the, the cow goes mad, starts acting crazy, right? Why? What's being affected? What part of the body? The brain. Encephalopathies, right? Encephalop refers to the brain. Spongiform, because the brain literally starts to look like a sponge. Big old holes in it, right? What they believe is happening is that a protein has mutated, right? And, and so even for some human diseases, right, they believe this is what has happened. This protein has mutated. Whether either you ingested it or unfortunately it happened to you. And this protein, when it mutates, it becomes enzymatic-like and causes all the other proteins like it to mutate as well. The problem is, 
is those mutated proteins are no longer functional proteins. So it's kind of a domino effect. What's the really scary thing? We don't know how to cure this. We don't know how to stop this. So once it starts, right, eventually the brain deteriorates and the person dies. Right? So how did this happen with cows and in Europe and why we were so afraid of getting cows from there at one time? Anyone know what they were doing? Yes. They were, unfortunately, cows were dying, right? And they turned that cow into food for other cows. And the process in which they did that, it wasn't a strong enough process to destroy these infectious proteins. Like these infectious proteins have to be heated for very long periods of time to be denatured such that they won't have this effect. So the, they're basically making cows cannibals, which cows are not, right? Um, they thought they were recycling, I guess, right? They didn't want to get rid of what they thought was potentially good, um, which turned out not to be good. Uh, so you even see this in countries where, um, in tribes, in countries in Africa and such, where um, fortunately they've hopefully stopped this practice, but they believe that if you ate your ancestors' brains, right, that you would get their knowledge, um, you could also get disease. <laughs> so not a good idea, right? So um, there, there have been cases where this, this has happened, right, where an individual is eaten or eaten monkey brains, right, um, and gotten uh, this type of infection from that. So um, just in time for Halloween, right? No eating zombie brains. Not a good idea. So that's it for vi viruses and...